Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Bassett. And I'm Catherine Logan. And welcome to the Sports Talks Podcast. On each episode, we chat about the most recent developments in sports medicine and dissect through all the noise so you know which literature should actually impact your practice. Today, we're coming to you live from the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine annual meeting in Washington, D.C. The AOSSM annual meeting is the premier sports medicine conference each year. Hosting over 3,500 attendees with hundreds of posters and paper presentations, exhibitors, and instructional course lecturers. This year proved to be as spectacular as years past. We were fortunate to have the opportunity to catch up with many of the presenters at the meeting and get their take on some of the hottest topics in sports medicine. Over these seven episodes, we're going to be exploring some of the hottest topics in sports medicine with these experts who are presenting at the AOSSM annual meeting. We are supported by MIOC Orthopedics. MIOC Orthopedics is leading a shift in the treatment of anterior cruciate ligament tears from reconstruction to restoration with the bare implant. Bridge enhanced ACL restoration facilitates healing of the torn ACL. Unlike reconstruction, the bare implant does not require a second surgical wound site to remove a healthy tendon from another part of the leg or the use of a donor tendon. The bare implant acts as a bridge between the two ends of the torn ACL. The surgeon injects a small amount of the patient's own blood into the implant and then inserts it between the torn ends of the ACL in a minimally invasive procedure. The combination of the bare implant and the patient's blood enables the body to heal the torn ends of the ACL back together while maintaining the ACL's original attachments to the femur and the tibia. The bare implant is resorbed by the body as the ACL heals. To learn more about the bare implant, including clinical study results and instructions for use, visit www.bareimplant.com. We are joined today by two amazing guests. Dr. Christian Latterman is the Chief of Sports Medicine Service and Director of the Cartilage Repair Center at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He is an Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Harvard Medical School and the Director of Research at Mass General Brigham Sports Medicine Service. Dr. Aaron Critch is the Chair of the Sports Medicine Division and a Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Mayo Clinic. He is a team physician for the Minnesota Timberwolves and is a member of numerous research groups, including the metrics of osteochondral allografts and research in osteochondritis decussans of the knee. So we're very excited to have these two gentlemen on our podcast today. So without further ado, let's get to the exhibit hall. All right, Christian, Aaron, thank you for joining us for this special episode of the Sports Talks podcast from the AOSSM annual meeting in D.C. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So there's been a growing movement to save the meniscus, which of course is ideal, but it's not always possible. So today we'd like to talk about what to do when saving the meniscus isn't an option, um, surgical options to address that meniscus deficiency. Okay. So we're going to start with meniscal allograft transplantation. Um, Aaron, great presentation this morning. I was at your ICL Mm -hmm. early this morning. It was on, um, your case was on oblique radial tears, um, but really enjoyed it. Um, So let's say that tear was more suitable to consider um, an MAT or a transplant. Walk us through a little bit, like how you select patients, like who are good, um, what are, you know, your indications for meniscal allograft transplantation? Yeah, well, I'm glad you started with patient indication because when we look at the results and the outcomes, it really depends on the patient that you're given. And uh, my mentors in fellowship used to say, you know, it's an operation that's either done too early or too late, meaning we don't do them prophylactically, but sometimes by the patients become symptomatic, they have a lot of cartilage damage, some arthritis already, and very, very young knees. So I think the earlier you can get to them, the better that they do. There's been a lot of literature and data showing that, you know, the more intact the cartilage, the less joint space narrowing, um, you know, other factors that uh, really help us decide on early transplantation, clearly better than salvage transplantation. Sure. Um, And what about a little bit of patient demographics? Um, You know, as far as BMI, you know, obviously you're doing your um, standing films and looking at alignment and things like that, but um, is there anything about um, their either their BMI, their um, different sport preferences, recreation, that sort of thing? Yeah, certainly a lot of factors that go into it. We try to look for patients that, of course, are meniscal deficient and having symptoms from that uh, at baseline. And then beyond that, it becomes a lot of, you know, what are the patient goals? What's their cartilage status? What's their alignment status? And if they have a quote unquote, you know, intact knee, meaning, you know, minimal chondromalacia, uh, then they're really an excellent candidate. 
Um, elevated BMI has been shown to be a poor prognostic factor, but it's not that that individual patient still wouldn't benefit from a transplant, but it is an opportunity to intervene, uh, try to decrease weight before performing sure. that operation. So we talked about patient indications. It sounds like that's the most important part in ensuring success of this operation. But other things that contribute is graft preservation technique and proper sizing of the graft. So Christian, can you walk us through what the different graft preservation techniques are and in your opinion, which one is preferable? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there, so there's there's always a different ways that you can treat an aloe graft uh, before you put it in. And there's uh, there's been over the years multiple different attempts starting from dehydrating grafts to irradiating them heavily to less uh, and I think the, the gold standard at this point is just basically is freshly frozen grafts that are either not or very low level irradiated. I think the, the science of that has been pretty clear and I don't think uh, you know a lot of other grafts are really in use. Um, and then in terms of sizing that is indeed critical. Um, it's, it's very important for uh, if you're using certain techniques, like uh, if you're using any technique where the anterior posterior horn stays connected, so a bone bridge technique, mm -hmm. um, sizing is super critical because you can't change it. Right. Um, uh, unless you are basically abandoning the technique approach. So that is really important and that needs to be done by MRI or by x-ray. Um, a lot of the companies that, that will have these menisci for you available, they can actually do that very proficiently, but they have to be really within either ideally the exact size on length and width of the meniscus. On the medial side, you have a little bit more leeway because most of us don't use bridges there. We use uh, basically just posterior and anterior horn fixations and there you can play a little bit with it but that makes it technically much harder because yeah. you have to utilize technology and techniques that that uh, uh, you know the male group and Aaron have really popularized with basically making sure that the meniscus rim dictates where the meniscus goes rather than necessarily where the anterior horn in the end lands and if you look at the anatomy there uh, the anterior horn um, meniscus anatomy on the medial meniscus particularly is extraordinarily variable mm -hmm. and that kind of sort of gives you gives you a little bit of a clue that that is probably less important uh, and more important is that the meniscus basically conforms along the plateau so you have a little bit more leeway there mm -hmm. yeah perfect um, I think before we get too deep into technique, um, I want to also speak to Aaron about, you know, as far as the types of graphs where you're getting your graphs. Um, and you also published a study, let's see, it was um, in... Journal of Orthopedic Research. research. Yes. That's right, <laughs> see, it was in the Journal of Orthopedic Research and you were doing, um, injecting mesenchymal stem cells um, to accelerate cell repopulization. Can you talk a little bit about that you know, developing that study, what you found, are you still doing that? Are you using the biologics? Yeah, that's a very interesting line of inquiry because, you know, as Christian uh, talked about, uh, pr primarily we're using frozen grafts, so yeah. meaning they're completely acellular. Uh, one of the complications of the operation is that these grafts can shrink over time, they can re-tear. So, you know, we made a decision about 15 to 20 years ago as a community to go away from fresh grafts that had a cellular population a lot of it due to logistical concerns yeah. and you know the precious uh, gift. But we want to look for ways to improve the actual tissue. So one of the ways to do that is to recellularize them. You know, we know that these meniscus transplants heal very reliably to the capsule, but what happens to that inner avascular tissue? So the idea was just can we add cells to it? In this particular study, uh, we actually just injected with mm -hmm. a needle um, and then looked at these labeled MSC cells over time, and they actually did redistribute uh, throughout the meniscus. So okay. this is uh, far away from being clinically ready, but maybe uh, a possible way that we can improve the biologic aspect of these graphs. And just to step back, when were you actually doing the injection? Is this on the back table? Were you doing it um, once it was already implanted? What was that step? Yeah, so um, we in this study looked at how long it took for the cells to repopulate, and this is something that would be feasible to do in the operating room mm -hmm. before you implanted the meniscus. So you could yeah. have some sort of thawing protocol where then you add cells before you place it in the patient. Okay. Are you adding any other biologics now when you do transplant? 
Uh, good question. Not typically. Um, you know, we rasp the capsule well. Uh, healing is very good there. I prefer to make bone sockets and use bone plugs, so mm -hmm. that tends to heal well. So I haven't been adding biologic adjuncts. I don't know if Christian's Christian, been adding. Yeah, any. same question. Uh, not typically, no, not for meniscus transplants, because uh, you actually create a fairly um, good biological yeah. um, attachment site, so to speak, because you are re you're removing a lot of the the uh, um, degenerative tissue and create fresh bleeding tissue and if you're using bone plugs just like Aaron says which I do too uh, you it's hard to find a better environment than freshly bleeding bone to attach something bony to it yeah right whether that is allograft or autograft so that is usually not so much the issue so that nicely segues into our next uh, area that we want to talk about, which is the surgical technique. We've kind of talked about a little bit the bone plugs versus doing the bone bridge. So Christian, you published a systematic review in the March issue of arthroscopy just this year, looking at five-year outcomes of medial meniscus allograft transplant and specifically looking at the impact of surgical technique on those outcomes. Can you tell us a little bit about that and which technique you use? Yeah, so, so you know, this, this is a, a, an overall review of the literature of basically the last 25 years. And um, like many of these reviews, the, the conclusions are relatively bland. Basically, it doesn't really matter what technique you do as long as you do it right. right? This is what it really comes down to. There's, there's been a lot of biomechanical work in the past that suggested that bone plugs are better than basically just doing sutures. And there's good and bad things about it. Um, and uh, as long as you follow the guidelines for the appropriate technique, it seems like the literature bears out that the, that the technique does not really matter too much. The, the important thing, however, is that you understand where the limits are. Right? And if you're using bone plugs, for example, it is important to understand that the bone plug has to be positioned correctly and sunk correctly if you're using sutures. Don't forget, when you're pulling these sutures into the tunnel, you're making the meniscus smaller, mm -hmm. right? So in that case, you may want to have an oversized meniscus, and that be that's where it becomes difficult. And um, I use bone plugs as well. I believe Ashley is the same. It sounds like we're all on the same page there, but certainly there's um, people who are doing really well with just a soft tissue graft. So what, you know, why do you think those also do well? What is great about those? Or maybe why don't you do them? And yeah. I'm in the same boat, so <laughs> I don't have an <laughs> So, so the, you know, there's literature um, kind of that shows equivalence. Uh, when you look at any clinical outcomes, you won't find any difference between the two. Uh, when you look at some biomechanics uh, pressure studies, you'll see a difference. Uh, we just published last year in AJSM a review that shows maybe a smaller retear rate uh, for bone mm -hmm. plugs versus soft tissue only. Uh, but I think the bottom line comes down to what Christian said. You have to do it well. You have to yeah. restore mother nature. If you're not recreating the anatomy, then this meniscus is extruded and you're not getting that condor protection and relief of symptoms that you want. Yeah. So. Uh, you touched on it a little bit as far as like you have to do it well you have to recreate the anatomy so we all know that that's really the lesson with a lot of the surgeries that we do that we're trying to restore the you know anatomic um, the way the way we were built mm -hmm. uh, so for people listening what are like lessons learned what are tips and tricks things that you sort of said oh I wish I knew that from the beginning I do this now this helps me you know um, Christian do you want to start with sharing some of your tips yeah, and tricks? So, so the biggest thing uh, that I have learned particularly on the medial meniscus um, is that um, the you need to let the plateau guide your sizing Right, so if you're using plugs, uh, do not basically just think basically this is where I put my plugs and I put them in and then wherever the sutures fall, that's where the sutures fall. I put the posterior plug in mm -hmm. and then I put one pole suture into the side and then I look where that meniscus aligns and if that meniscus aligns perfectly along the rim, then I may take it. If it doesn't, I position one or two sutures at the rim to make sure it really comes down on the rim and then that anterior horn I literally just put wherever it falls. Yeah. And uh, you know, and interesting enough, uh, I also noticed that and if you look at the anatomy you actually see this very clearly, the anterior horn typically does not attach on top of the plateau, it mm -hmm. attaches anterior. Yeah. And that's one thing. And then the other thing that I've learned is be deliberate on uh, opening the MCL if you need to. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need enough room to do that, otherwise you are creating just all kind of problems for yourself. Same question, Aaron. Yeah, I think there's a lot of little technical tips and tricks, but clearly it starts with visualization. So on the medial side, it's uh, every time, you know, pie crust the MCL, get get a view. 
Uh, for me, the single most important step is getting the posterior horn root attachment anatomy correct. And that's one of the reasons I use a bone plug because mm -hmm. I'm good at what I do a lot. I'm not good at what I don't do a lot. So for me, you know, we're repairing a lot of root tears now. Sure. I just use the same technique for the bone plugs, both medial and lateral meniscus. So for me, it's about repetition and being able to hit that target. So uh, find a transtibial root guide that works for you and, you know, is very uh, reproducible in your hands. And then it's just about reps. And I think over time, you'll consistently get the plug where you want it to, which reduces extrusion and hopefully leads to a better outcome. Yeah. And, you know, just side sort of question when we do our root repairs I do think that is something that a lot of people struggle with it's like did we you know get good visualization to start with have we skipped that step and then is it becoming a futz in the back because I don't think you know I think the guides are always improving and it's getting better as far as like their profile um, but it's tricky you know and I, I think that's a really good point to make to say like all right if I just think of it as my root repair where do I feel comfortable where do I you know sort of you know, make sure that I get that sort of consistent um, sort of outcome because that's a tricky spot. But it sounds like once you get that done, the rest of the procedure, you probably feel like a little bit of a relief, but maybe. Yeah, I think once, it's always, you, you, know. once you have that spot and the meniscus is in, you're like, okay, now okay, I, can I can take a deep now. breath. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly when you take the deep breath. Once that meniscus is in and you see that it's not twisted on itself okay. or yeah. whatever. <laughs> I've never seen that. Yeah. <laughs> never happened. Yeah, yeah exactly. And we'll be right back. We are supported by Stryker. Seeking a clinically proven solution for your patients with massive and irreparable rotator cuff tears that has the potential for early functional recovery and pain relief? Check out InSpace. InSpace is the industry's only minimally invasive, biodegradable subacromial balloon spacer for the arthroscopic treatment of massive irreparable rotator cuff tears. InSpace is designed to restore the subacromial space without requiring sutures or fixation devices. Learn more at striker.com slash InSpace. And we're back. Awesome. So for the second half of our discussion, we want to talk about that medial meniscus um, prosthetic replacement. So Christian, you're presenting a paper tomorrow on yes. results of the new surface. It was a prospective multi-center RCT three-year follow-up, I believe, three -year follow -up. Um, called the Venus Trial. Um, can you tell us? Yes, congratulations. This is really exciting. So can you tell us a little bit more about like this implant? What is it? How do you place yeah. it? So the, uh, this is a, a one trial out of actually three trials that were, uh, were done with this implant. It's a polyurethane um, implant that's reinforced with, um, uh, with um, fibers uh, along the uh, meniscus um, uh, circumference. And um, it is a very well known um, material uh, that we know has very, very similar um, properties to a normal meniscus tissue and this is why it's been utilized actually in a couple of different approaches. So the new surface specific is a little bit a, it's, an, it's a spacer. So it does not function like a meniscus per se, but it functions more as a spacer that sits in the right spot. And the idea here is to allow um, a restoration of a meniscus function in patients who are typically a little bit older, who have gone through a full meniscectomy, and uh, who may not be the ideal candidate for a meniscus transplant. Now, in the trial, of course, we have idealized you know, the, the, the patient population, so that would be the same population that we would normally otherwise do a transplant on with the difference that we included uh, slightly older patients also. The requirement here is, is that there has to be a rim standing. So you can't okay. have a complete resection of the meniscus rim, like, um, but that is rarely the case, fortunately. And um, the, the interesting thing about this study is, is that that implant actually works. Uh, it works really well. It improved the patient reported outcomes significantly uh, in the patient that I had it, uh, that, they, that had the implant uh, for up to three years. Um, that's the data that we know. And what struck me particularly um, uh, when I was working with that, uh, with that trial was that these patients' activity level are tremendous. Um, I mean, they, yeah. those are people who are extraordinarily active, who are very happy with it. Um, and uh, and that's basically the data that we are reporting. Well, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. 
You talked a little bit about activity level. This morning at the ICL, there was a lot of talk about survivorship, um, the activities that surgeons start to advise following MAT. I think that's also um, all over the map, you know, what people are comfortable with. So um, with both sort of technique types or both options, you know, what's your guidance? Like, how do you set expectations from that, you know, those early visits? So Aaron, if you want to start with you. Yeah, that's... Um it's really the game is won and lost at yeah. those early visits, totally. um, yeah. trying to lay down the foundation. Um, what's hard about some of these patients is you have clear expectations, but then they have perception shift of their expectations at six months. They're like, well, I've already accomplished pain relief right. and my knee feels great. Well, I so want why not? the next thing, the next thing. <laughs> yeah. So you have to kind of sit down and make a little bit of an agreement or a pact with them. Uh, for me personally, I do allow uh, some impact activities, but you know, any cutting, twisting, pivoting sports, really do increase the chances that they tear their graft and then they're back to square one, which you know would really be, I think, heartbreaking. At the same time, there are people that will choose to take that risk. And you know we try to talk to them about that before surgery, but ultimately I, I do leave that value judgment with the patient, Yeah. Uh, but I give my full recommendations of what we believe is best. And I, I think staying away from cutting pivoting sports after meniscus transplant is, is the best option. Well, I think this, the word salvage has to be part of the conversation, yes. you know, and just this is not, hey, you have a little vertical tear, I'm going to repair here. Um, it, you know, using that word salvage, it, it should sort of strike something with them that, yes, at the end of the day, I believe the same as you, or it, they can do as they wish, you know, um, ultimately, but it's our job to sort of make sure they understand that this isn't, you know, just a simple sort of fix, that this is a much bigger deal and the survivorship is not the same if you, you know, kind of get after it to an extent. Now, you mentioned the activity level people were getting back to in this trial was tremendous. So is are there any activity restrictions? Is it similar to MAT where you're trying to minimize that pivoting, twisting, or do you not put any restrictions on? Yeah, of course. I mean, the recommendations are different from what people do. Right. Oh, yeah, so, sure. uh, yeah, it, it, you know, don't get the wrong impression. If you put a new surface into somebody, I'm not telling them basically go back and run the Boston Marathon yeah, next year. Um, uh, but that said, I, you know, a couple of my patients are ski patrol yeah. and they ski literally 150 days a year. Uh, on it and and they actually do well with it uh, so is it possible yes is it possible for everybody absolutely not mm -hmm. and I think this is the same thing with the meniscus transplants I mean one thing that I often use to tell people uh, is uh, you know just keep in mind there's not a single professional athlete who returned back to athletics after a meniscus transplant mm -hmm. right and yeah. and uh, a big problem in, in young hockey goalies, for example, I see that quite frequently on with lateral menisci. You've got to be honest with the people and to basically tell them, listen, you know, you are no longer in that tier, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, you know, yes, you may have the engine, but the body is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a hard discussion to have. Yeah, um, now, before we, uh, I wanted to segue to your favorite topic. Oh, your favorite topic. Oh, go ahead, you take it away then. I know you're. <laughs> Uh, so I know I think Christian knows Aaron. You don't. You might not know. I was a physical therapist for seven years for uh, med school, so I get a little you know, excited about rehab or annoyed <laughs> if we skip it. <laughs> so um, talk about uh, we we kind of talked about the end game. Yes. Like all right, they return and they do stuff, but all the stuff in between. Um, you know, what are you doing in those early stages, Aaron? We can start with you. Like what you know, what is their weight bearing status? Do you restrict range of motion? Do you do CPM? You know, any of those things. Yeah, I would say there's definitely been a lot of progress on the rehab front. Uh, we've become more confident, you yes. know, not seeing like early failures, for example. So our current protocol, we do let them uh, partially weight bear uh, for the first few weeks. Yeah. I do keep their uh, range of motion limited to 90 of flexion, mm -hmm. just loading in flexion uh, the first month is probably, you know, potentially detrimental. But beyond that, after three to four weeks, they can fully weight bear, they get the range of motion back, you know, they're not in a brace. Um, so really plug back into life uh, by six weeks, I would say. Uh, at that point, it becomes, you know, they're feeling really good, and then you're trying to hold them back right. um, a little bit. Now, as you know, it all depends, as a physical therapist, yeah. what they come in with as well. Yeah. So some of these knees have had painful effusions for years, and they have quadriceps atrophy, and, you know, you're just finally getting them out of those symptoms that cycle so yeah. now it's going to take them a lot longer you know to build that foundation so at minimum i tell them about six months of you know rehabilitation working with a physical therapist but recognizing some of these patients can take a full year before they're able to get back to where they need to be 
And Christian, I know um, at the Brigham, there's a really nice relationship. You guys have really great physical therapists. Are they doing any special programming, anything like that? Um, not specifically special programming. The special programming basically comes into play with, uh, with what we give them as our protocol that we have gone through for back and forth between the physical therapist and us. And, and uh, I do make a little bit of a distinction between lateral and medial meniscus transplants because I do use different techniques and I'm comfortable letting them weight bear fully after a week or two when I do lateral meniscus transplants, the medial side, and that, that goes along the line, just like I would re, uh, rehab a bucket handle tear, versus the medial side, I rehab more like a root tear, because this is okay. basically the technique that I use, so I'm much more conservative on that, and uh, protect the weight bearing a little bit more. CPM, I do use it if I can, if not, I just put them on a stationary bike a little bit earlier, um, and uh, and the, the, the most important thing I think uh, with it is I'm no longer too worried about the early healing, right? But I think you need to restrict their flexion past 90, which is what Aaron said, because yeah. you have worried about, about the shearing of that meniscus repair in the back. And then the other thing is, is really critical is, is you need to assess what's sitting around the knee, which is your musculature, mm -hmm. right? And, and we, I'm a big fan of blood flow restrictor therapy mm -hmm. yeah, um, so. for that. I think this is a real key and a game changer for a lot of these things. And the other thing is, is that I've learned through my work on osteoarthritis, actually, after ACLs, we are now increasingly starting to examine uh, the actual gait patterns of patients to see where the true deficits are as they are basically graduating out of physical therapy and the insurance cuts them off, right. then they are basically left in the void by themselves. And so we are trying to basically then assess them, look where the deficits are, and then specifically start training them in order to return them to better function because the meniscus doesn't help you if your knee still doesn't work right. Right. Absolutely. For after surgery as part of rehab, are you using any bracing, any unloader bracing to offload that compartment to allow for healing? I don't. I don't either. You know, some people are doing that. Um, we talked about as part of the procedure, you are lengthening the MCL. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, putting them in an unloader brace into valgus, trying to offload, I think you're maybe going against your MCL healing as well. So I think it's yeah. just too complex. There's not enough uh, defined benefits. Mm -hmm. so I haven't been using it. I have a follow-up question about that. So <laughs> you had mentioned um, kind of pie crossing the MCL to improve visualization. What if you get in there and visualization is great? Are you still pie crossing to lengthen the MCL a bit to offload that compartment? Or do you leave it alone if there's enough laxity there? Uh, good question. I... For me, that's a theoretic one because I've never seen a compartment <laughs> that, that hasn't been yeah. um, that tight. But um, there's actually some data out of Mayo Clinic Arizona where they did uh, they compared pie crusting with their root repairs mm -hmm. uh, with and without. And the group that did have MCL lengthening, you know, almost similar to an osteotomy, yeah. uh, where you maybe decrease pressures on that compartment somewhat, uh, was beneficial. So um, I would just have a very low threshold, and I pretty much do it every time. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to touch on the BFR because we, uh, we've we done uh, prior episodes with Eddie Chang, who is at Inova. Um, he does a lot of uh, research in BFR with uh, Robin West. Uh, they, I know she's using it with her baseball athletes. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a big fan of BFR. I use it a lot with um, my ACLs as well. So do you have a period of time that you, so some physical therapists are nervous to use it in the first early weeks because they're sort of in some of their literature uh, they get concerned about wound issues um, I don't have that sort of restriction I sort of say as soon as they feel like they can tolerate it and are comfortable but I'm anxious to hear your thoughts yeah absolutely no concerns mm -hmm. um, you know when that first came up uh, about 10 15 years ago now uh, there was a lot of concern about blood clots, etc., and, yeah. and mm -hmm. other things that has all been pretty much shown to not be the case, and the, the benefits of, of, of it are huge. So in a moment where I see that somebody postoperatively has a hard time uh, regaining mm -hmm. uh, quadriceps activity and strength, I'm fine with starting to do that if they can tolerate it. That's a big deal because that's actually painful. Mm. Yeah. And Have some people it? really I'm can't done. tolerate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is painful. Yeah, we held, uh, actually at my clinic, we held like a 
uh, like a certification course because I was trying to get more and more physical therapists in the Denver area to get the certification so they can bring it in because when I first I'd left Vail gone to Denver and Vail it was sort of like standard of care um, and then Denver there's only a couple select clinics that really had it and had gone through the certification so um, anyway as far as hosting this course you end up sort of ma- being made the like the demo person a lot <laughs> and you sort of say oh my god this is so hard <laughs> But very good. Good to get that perspective. So before we finish up, <laughs> who's heckling us? I know. It's good to have a live one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, all the, it's all the glass. <laughs> um, so before we wrap up, I did want to talk a little bit about um, rehab after the new surface. Oh, yeah. So are you restricting weight bearing for a period of time? Are you restricting range of motion? Are you bracing? So um, the answer is, uh, in the trial, they were trying to do that. Uh, Practically, the patient basically feels so good relatively quickly that that really is not happening. Okay. And they left the rehab pretty much open. So I tell you, most of these patients, even after after, uh, we had a couple of patients where we had to put second implants in because they tore. Um, uh, Even after that, within a couple of weeks, they're back to complete normal function, most of them. That's great. We saw one of uh, your colleagues this morning, Dr. Elizabeth Matskin. Um, she told us to ask you about kayaking. <laughs> <laughs> Very few meniscus yeah. tears when you're kayaking, I can tell you that. But, ever, but I can tell you just last weekend I was out there, yeah. broke my puddle, paddle in half, and then you, so you need to How be prepared to occasionally swim around. It's, like, so. it's like throwing a war equipment, you just like threw your paddle. No, and yeah. no it, it, was yeah. just, it was just uh, application of pressure at the wrong time. <laughs> And Aaron, I believe you got an award this morning. Is that true? Uh, that's that's the rumor. Yeah. Um, but no, we were very fortunate uh, in the uh, Masters competition to win the red jacket. Yeah. Um, oh, congratulations. Obviously a, a, a team award just for our work in meniscus root repair. So very uh, grateful and honored awesome. uh, to be recognized. So. Yeah, congrats. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been a great conversation. We're really excited and, and really happy you took the time out of your schedule to be here with us. So thank you so much. Thank you yeah. very much for thank having you. us. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sports Talks. We hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did. Make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on all things sports medicine. Exciting announcement, we are also now on YouTube. You can find links to all of our social channels and our contact information on our website, www.thesportstalkspod.com. We love to hear from you.